is the third uh, of the series so far in a total of eight speakers that will be uh, held over the coming year. Um, it's part of a larger project that uh, I am co-leading with Kate McNamara, also at Georgetown University, where we are thinking about how to re-envision the study of international political economy, which we call GPEP, the Global Political Economy Project. For those that are interested, you can see videos of the previous talks uh, on the GPEPR website, uh, where we have YouTubes of them. So let me get right to today's event, where we are going to be having an hour-long conversation on the intersection of race and global migration. We've invited Andrew Rosenberg from uh, the University of Florida. He's currently an assistant professor, and his research centers on this question of the intersection between race and migration. He will give a 20-minute brief introduction to his research, um, start the conversation going, and then we'll turn it over to Ken Opalo, who is an uh, assistant professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Drew and then uh, for, for uh, moderation with Ken. Thanks to both of you. Cool. Uh, thanks, Abe. Um, I think, yeah, my, my video is on and everything. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. And I think the, the project's really exciting. And so I think uh, I wasn't really sure how to do this. And so I, I knew I was gonna be coming to this talk immediately after teaching like 15 PhD students about sampling distributions and, I, and hypothesis testing. So I decided to go ahead and uh, make some slides, which I'm going to share with you all now. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll go for about 20 minutes and um, you know, then you know, really excited about the conversations that are gonna come after this. So I, I, I like to call this, you know, little talk, uh, old wine and new label list bottles. And, uh, and I'm going to sort of unpack what I mean by that. And the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a little history. I'm going to stand on my research soapbox for a second. I'm going to talk about some of the current research that I'm doing in this area, you know, in sort of shameless self-plug fashion. And then I'm going to talk about the future. I'm going to talk about uh, future areas of research on the intersection of uh, race, racism, and international migration. You know, so if you're a, um, a student or a policymaker or just an, you know, an engaged citizen, you know, hopefully uh, there'll be something uh, uh, cool, interesting, and politically important that you can take from this. So the, this talk centers around three propositions, and this is not just this talk, but, but, but my research in general. And the idea is, I think it's pretty uncontroversial, that race has always been central to the modern politics of international migration. It continues to be central despite uh, the end of explicitly uh, racist uh, quotas and laws during decolonization, and that we should study it uh, because it's obviously politically, socially, economically, morally important, even though there are some obvious uh, uh, issues associated with studying it, but we should, but we should still do it. Now, the little history I, I, I promised uh, goes back to actually the American Declaration of Independence, and I didn't know this until I, I, I started doing this research. But, but actually, uh, one of the, the 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 founding issues that the colonists, the American colonists, listed in the American Declaration of Independence was a grievance with the British Crown regarding uh, uh, the Crown's restriction of what amounts to the colony's immigration policies. Now, the colonies worried about uh, undesirable immigrants. They worried about paupers, convicts, and so forth coming, coming to their shores. And they wanted to be able to attract the desirable uh, immigrants that would hopefully uh, allow their uh, colonies to thrive. And so really at the, at the very beginning of the American experiment, uh, this concern with undesirability really shaped uh, how people thought about who to let in, where, when, and why. But of course, the most famous and the most pointed to uh, uh, initial 
American experience with explicit racism in international migration uh, is usually the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is the first uh, instance of explicit racism in immigration policy making uh, anywhere in the world. And um, in an earlier iteration of this talk, you know, I had all sorts of examples from uh, Australia, Germany, the United Kingdom, and uh, these places, these countries and the people and politicians within them were really concerned about the, uh, the, the, the social, the, the debilitating social, political and otherwise effects of allowing too much racially undesirable immigration into their societies because the story goes that doing so uh, would ruin the the, the spirit or economic productivity or the moral basis of society, which would eventually lead to ruin. Now, in the case of the United States, all this changed uh, in, with the passage of the 1952 and 1965 Immigration Nationality Act and related amendments. And, and what these acts did was remove the explicitly racist uh, criteria and the national origin quota system from American uh, uh, immigration law. And the implication of this is that now, uh, despite our ugly past, we now uh, have a truly colorblind immigration policy. We, we care about accepting the best and the brightest into our country. And this sentiment uh, spread throughout the rest of uh, uh, the immigrant receiving world, including a little bit later in the early 1970s, Australia, which was home to the set of uh, famously racist white Australia policies. And the shift during decolonization dovetails really nicely with this Whiggish story from conventional international relations, which says that by the end of decolonization in the 1980s, the post-colonial world achieved a whole bunch of things, including equal sovereignty. But as you'll notice here in this quote from uh, Dunn and Roy Smith's uh, recent, uh, recent collection, uh, racial equality. And so the presumption was is that after decolonization, of explicit racism, explicit racism was gone from uh, international migration, just as it was gone from the rest of uh, the international system. Now, <clears throat> uh, I don't know about uh, all of you out there, but I uh, live in the world and I uh, have access to uh, the conventional news and social media, and I know uh, about the politics of the day. And there are certain things, uh, certain political events, uh, not just in this country, but throughout the world, throughout not just you know, the global north, but also the global south, that suggest that um, uh, immigration, immigration policy making, and that whole set of political issues aren't as colorblind as uh, the, the, the sort of progressive triumphalist story would want us to believe. And you, know, you can look at uh, uh, things in the media like this cartoon, or um, just the mere fact that if you just look at border and land control policies throughout countries in the OECD, you can see how uh, the restrictiveness, the unambiguous restrictiveness of them has just gone through the roof. So even though, um, you know, President Trump, for example, might say, might talk about how the Obama administration was soft on uh, immigrants and soft on the border. Well, that might be represented with just this little itty bitty blip right here in this general uh, longer historical process whereby the United States and other countries in the global north have become unambiguously more restrictive and the combination of this, quite frankly, explicit racism and veering into symbolic racism, depending on who you talk to, and the unambiguously more restrictive uh, nature of uh, modern immigration policies fits really nicely with a recent trend in the international relations scholarship towards looking at how issues of race and racism continue to constitute not just the field of international relations going back to uh, the early 20th century and late 19th century, but also how race and racism uh, are, have been important in the history of the rise of the nation state, 
international political economy. You might uh, recognize one of the names uh, on this farthest to the right article and in the constitution of the international order more generally. Now, um, scholars in not just in international relations and IPE, but in other adjacent fields have, uh, have seized on this and have conducted quite a lot of research on, for instance, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the latent discrimination that exists in the modern uh, uh, immigration laws in liberal states. Uh, there's a lot of interesting theoretical and critical work on refugees as a surplus population. And, um, and, and this obviously uh, spills over into the study of refugees as well. And now look, this work is super important. And in fact, um, I think I just put up on the screen, you know, eight different articles, all of which have been, you know, all of which find their way into my, into my current work, even though my work looks a little bit different in terms of, uh, you know, maybe epistemology and methodology, but it's really important work and it, and it really highlights the importance and continued political salience of race and racism throughout the international system and the international political economy beyond migration. The fact remains though, no matter how uh, politically important something is in general, uh, it, it continues to be the case that the, you know, quote unquote mainstream in, 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 in scare quotes, of IPE, econ, and IR continue to ignore many of these issues. Um, you know, just, just flip open uh, uh, your favorite uh, mainstream academic journal in one of these areas, and uh, on average, you're not going to find anything written about uh, not just the intersection of race and migration, but about race and racism as well. And my position, and, you know, this might be where I start to veer into the, uh, uh, the controversial part of the talk. I mean, my position though is that the mainstream doesn't understand or believe the evidence that a lot of this other really important work brings to bear. And my goal, at least in the early part of my career so far, has been to use mainstream tools to unmask uh, the race and racism in international migration uh, that continues to exist, as well as the other socially undesirable aspects of the international system. And like I just said, um, look, just please note, this is a super controversial opinion or position to hold in the critical IR IP circles. Um, uh, I've had, I've had uh, panelists at conferences tell me I'm committing epistemic genocide. I mean, like, like there are really important ethical, practical methodological issues associated with doing what I'm doing. And I, and, and I want to acknowledge that up front. But this is also super controversial in mainstream circles too. And the reason it's controversial in mainstream circles too is because, uh, you know, let's think about the, the so-called credibility revolution in economics and IPE that goes to how these mainstream folks are conceiving of the proper way of doing research. I mean, if you, you think about race, racism and international migration, uh, there's nothing we can randomly assign uh, leaders rarely overtly talk about it, and so we don't have cool text data to work with. Uh, we don't have really good data on this at all in general. And the verdict, even if somebody is sympathetic, is that these issues are invisible, irrelevant, non-existent, or at least certainly not IPE in the conventional sense. And the result is most of the great work at this intersection so far has been mostly theoretical or critical, really lying at this um, really important and, 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 and fruitful intersection. And my position is that we're leaving scientific money on the table and ignoring these really politically important issues that hopefully we'll be able to talk about later um, today. And the reason we're leaving money on the table, and this is sort of the, the most controversial of the slides, is because um, in mainstream circles, there, uh, uh, there is an overemphasis on being on a particular part of this you know, sort of production possibilities frontier of uh, research for graduate students and junior folks where, you know, the x-axis is how convincingly you can answer the question, how important the question is, and, you know, you want to be somewhere on this frontier, right? I mean, I'm going towards, I'm going to like the the intro micro stuff, but, but I contend perhaps a bit flippantly 
that a lot of most modern migration IPE and you know, migration in economics and in related fields is, is focused down here in this corner where people are answering really small questions in a very convincing way. And that's really important because, you know, you want to build up a lot of evidence about a lot of really important things. And, and, and we can talk about the large uh, uh, issues that emerge out of that type of evidence. But you also don't want to be up here in the top left where you're answering the biggest, most politically important question known to person kind, but doing so in a way that no, uh, you know, methodological culture will consider uh, to be convincing. And so uh, for if I don't know if there's any graduate students out there or undergrads, I mean, I would I would encourage you uh, in a slightly self serving way to stay away from the corner solutions. And, and this is my attempt at doing this. This is my book manuscript called uh, residual racism, why inequality persists in international migration. It's under review someday. I hope that you all will have a chance to read it cite it, comment on it, or um, you know, hate it even. But uh, you know, I'm going to talk about uh, this for, for you know, hopefully a minute or two. And the purpose of this project is to uncover the racism and structural racial inequality that continues to lurk behind the colorblind policies. And to do so, I sort of fuse this modern story about how race and racism uh, exist in the modern world with a historical story as well that, that, that takes the, the important events of history um, uh, uh, you know, as, uh, to be as important as they actually are. And the basic idea is colonialism and legal racism from the Anglo-European world um, had a lot of really bad effects on the non-white world, the global south. They did a lot of violence, a lot of damage. And what this violence and damage did was not just create the public perception of dangerous inferior colonies and colonial subjects, but this history of violence and exploitation and the, the, the narratives around constructing these places as unstable or violent leads to perceptions, continual perceptions about the dangerousness and inherent inferiority of post-colonial states as well. And so in a world with sovereign equality, calling migrants or putative immigrants or refugees from these places isn't uh, uh, inherently dangerous. It's not racist, of course. How could it be racist? We have colorblind laws. We just want to select objectively the best and the brightest that are out there. So, you know, how much better could we do? We got rid of the explicitly racist laws. We're just trying to select objectively the best and brightest. But the problem is, is that the idea of the best and brightest is not objective. These long histories of violence, exploitation, and colonialism created perceptions of these places as being inherently, inherently unstable, violent, backward, and it leads people like, you know, uh, um, uh, I can't remember the, the first name, but uh, uh, Collier, who I believe wrote Strangers in Our Mist, to argue something like, you know, immigrants from uh, uh, the developing world will bring with them their inherently low total factor productivity and ruin the productivity of Western societies. And this is a version of, a, of an ecological inference. And I, you know, I know people might, might balk at this characterization, but this occurs when we draw inferences about people on the basis of the characteristics of groups or of, of the, the places that they come from. And I wish I could take full credit for this argument and this story, but I really draw heavily on uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's argument in The African Roots of War, in which he makes the argument that uh, the slave trade, uh, in his words, furiously mangled the continent of Africa. And um, throughout this process, Africa became another name for barbarism. And this uh, exploitation created precisely the state of helplessness, which invites aggression and exploitation. So he's talking about, you know, he's talking about the continent of Africa in the sort of, uh, you know, in the, in the midst 
of the uh, the second of uh, the First World War, which later in this this article he talks about is, is an imperial war in a similar fashion that Lenin does a year later. But but this is really getting to the heart of of, of what I'm trying to do in this book. And just to breeze through some partial evidence and get to the fun stuff, um, I show that citizens from the non-white global south migrate far less than a, a colorblind international system driven only by market fundamentals would suggest, and this is getting worse. Uh, Western states that receive more racially different immigrants enact more restrictive policies, and this is getting worse. And there's a U shape that occurred. So we saw an initial decrease in policy restrictiveness after decolonization, but this was followed by a strong uh, restrictionist reaction that is also getting worse. And the upshot is that the post-colonial international system is actually a, least, a, a less equal place, a more unequal place. Um, and uh, I have a story about how this logic of restriction spread to the post-colonial world, and I'd be happy to, to, to talk about that in Q and A. And the implication is that removing explicitly racist laws is not sufficient to end uh, racial inequality and international migration. And for people who study American politics and American history, this is obvious. You know, we've been talking since the '50s about how uh, removing de jure segregation doesn't mean that uh, de facto segregation is is going to vanish with it. And this is my attempt at showing how hierarchy continues to lurk in the international system and the IP in, in the international political economy. And if you're interested in a proto version of this, um, you know, please see the ISQ article on the reading list. And you know, please feel free to, to message about, about the book. So what's next? In my 90 seconds, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, 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 how where I see this, this research agenda going. So migration is a super strange area of IPE. And it's super strange because many elites and citizens of, of, of Western societies who care about the freedom of the market and market fundamentals more than basically anything, try to disregard or curb the free market and labor um, at the same time. It's this sort of Janus face condition which is, is, is really strange. You know, it would be really strange to an alien who came and like observed what our politics look like. It, it, it's puzzling. It doesn't really make any sense. And so let's talk about a research agenda or some pieces of one that'll uncover more about this. And, and just a plug, like that's why I'm super excited to, to be here and to be invited and included in this project because, you know, the, the whole idea of, of GPEP for, for my money is that, you know, they're trying to this project's trying to reorient the study of IP toward a study of IP as if people matter. And, 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 and that's what I'm trying to get as, as well. And you can think about studying this at three different levels of analysis, at the individual level, the policymaking level, and even at the level of the international system, which involves the interdependence of uh, the individual and the state level. And, and look, the problem here is that none of this will change. None of the bad stuff that I've talked about so far in the talk will change until the West changes its behavior. And this depends on public opinion. And even though uh, Michael Clemens, Lamp Pritchett, and others have, have, have done a lot of work to systematically dismantle the economic arguments against immigration, uh, this message and this evidence continues to fall on deaf ears, and it has so for a really long time. And so and this leads me to the question of why so many people have fact resistant worldviews when it comes to immigration. And, you know, I know that the, uh, the word race and racism, the, those words are sort of staring us right in the face, but I'm genuinely interested in exploring this a little bit more. So we could ask what's the relationship between racial resentment and policy preferences in, you know, immigration or refugee resettlement or what have you. Because this leads to the question of whether we can design a more palatable open immigration regime that allows all countries throughout the world to take advantage of what I think Michael Clemens said in 2013 is trillion dollar bills uh, laying on the sidewalk. And this is going to require learning a lot more about sort of the, the yucky aspects of public opinion in the context in which people will be willing to support more quote unquote culturally different immigration. Um, let's talk a little bit more speculatively for hopefully 60 seconds. 
Um, this leads to an, another question of why the nation and the nation state remains a legitimate category of exclusion in the international system. Why do so many citizens in the global north and the global south continue to accept the distributional and moral consequences of the birthright lottery? There's nothing special about me. I was just born in the United States in a particular year, but even though that that's random, people all over the world continue to accept that that moral basis is a solid one and restrict immigration on those bounds. And this leads into um, further interesting questions about um, why people support things like ICE raids throughout this country, not because they're actually afraid of, uh, uh, of immigrants and refugees, but they, but they think that the, the American uh, immigration and refugee regime actually needs to be more punitive because being more punitive gives these people that aren't deserving of being in our country their just desserts. And the reason I the reason I want to highlight is, is because you know I watched Robbie Shillingham's talk from last week, and I think it really speaks to the the really important intersection of IP and political theory, plus um, a historical approach that I think everybody would benefit from. Um, and you could ask some uh, some system level questions as well. You know, immigration and immigration policy doesn't just affect destination states in the global north. Um, it also affects sending states, the global economy, and the international system. And one way I'm interested in exploring this is to use computational modeling to explore uh, the global distributive consequences of, for example, small changes in immigration policy towards being more racially discriminatory or insert your uh, favorite research question here. And you know who cares? Well, even though these issues also take place at the level of the system, and people feel really you know bound by uh, by systemic questions because they don't feel like they have any agency. Um, but if you think about the system, what this is trying to reveal is the 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 important knock on consequences. For example, of somebody like Bernie Sanders saying that he really wants to focus his efforts on the American worker and design an immigration regime that protects the American worker without realizing that this has important knock-on consequences that could actually harm people throughout the world in a material sense that he actually wants to protect too. And of course, this is an interesting place where uh, Sanders and President Trump overlap a little bit. Um, and this also speaks to the issue of the cyclical nature of global racial inequality, where it comes from and how it's sustained. And look, the story might seem dire, um, but if you're a student out there, you know, please don't despair. And these are some of the most politically important issues in the world, in the world economy and the international system. And I'm really excited to see all the wonderful things all you all do to, uh, to help uh, you know, push humankind forward. Thank you. Please get in touch. Um, I'm always excited to, to hear from people and to talk more. So sorry for going over. Yeah. Uh... Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, this is this is a great presentation, um, and and uh, lots lots of interesting parts. Uh, as as the moderator, I'll, I'll I'll start with a few questions before opening it up to Q and A. And uh, I guess my my first question is on uh, this sort of early opening in the immediate post colonial period. Mm -hmm. uh, could you could you tell us a little bit more about you know what it was that led to that opening? Was it just an attitudinal shift, uh, and you know what were some of the uh, if, if 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 you know we have a, a traditional IP listener uh, you know mm -hmm. who thinks about uh, uh, jobs uh, and the threats or perceived threats of immigrants to jobs. Uh, what were some of the political foundations of that opening uh, beyond uh, attitudinal shifts? And and as, as you answer that, maybe you could also tell us how we should be thinking about the interaction between attitudes, which inform you know, how we frame questions about uh, immigration, who's desirable and who's not. Uh, and uh, so the interaction between those attitudes and the uh, electoral uh, sort of IPE, call them standard, quote unquote, standard IP concerns that politicians may have. Uh, and, and so, you know, the two as acting out in the immediate post-colonial period that led to that brief opening that uh, you highlight in your talk and, and writing. 
Yeah, that's, um, that, that's a great question. And um, uh, of course there's a debate and uh, I, you know, I, I have a position on this, but most people, I think like Aristide Zolberg and a, and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of people who studied the, the history of immigration policy uh, throughout the global north, a lot of people point to uh, the end of World War II in a variety of ways to explain um, uh, to explain the momentum that made it the case that you know states like the United States and Australia began to dismantle their explicitly racist um, uh, policies. So um, uh, on the one hand, um, Nazi atrocities are, are are pointed to by a variety of scholars. And um, the interaction of uh, the, the historical experience with Nazism and the, the Cold War led in particular some to say that the United, the United States to change their disposition because they didn't want, on the one hand, uh, people to reflect back on Nazi atrocities and the, uh, the American antecedents of those atrocities uh, uh, and, and reflect on uh, the, the the racist nature of immigration policies, and so this led to a, you know, this led to a, a you know, kind of a, like a shaming effect, really, if, if you want to think about this in a social way. But also, um, uh, you know, this was the, the beginning of the Cold War, and um, some some historians argue that this was uh, the United States and its Western allies trying to guard against um, uh, naming and shaming from the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. And I think, um, uh, I think that's pretty, I, I think that's also pretty uh, persuasive. On the other hand, um, there are some sociologists and, and historians of immigration policy making like uh, David Fitzgerald at UCSD and um, uh, his co-authors, um, uh, Cook Martin, um, sorry, I can't remember the first name. Um, they actually argue that it was um, the, uh, uh, the new states in Latin America, like the, the sort of middle to small powers in the Latin American world that actually uh, uh, they applied pressure on the United States and its Western allies in international fora of various sorts in the uh, in the 1940s and 1950s that actually led them uh, to change their policies, and they point to how you know places like um, uh, uh, you know Bolivia and Colombia and, and other countries in in Latin America actually removed many aspects of their discriminatory immigration policies before the United States did, and that the United States gets all the credit, but actually it was this naming and shaming on behalf of the United States' you know, quote unquote Western allies in Latin America that actually applied this pressure. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I, I think just like most historical stories, every, everything is going, you know, all these things can be going on here at, at, at the same time. And, and that's why, you know, that's probably why I'm not a historian because uh, I can't, uh, you know, because I, I sort of buy all of the, the aspects of both. Um, but your, your, your second question about, um, you know, the interaction with, it, the interaction between attitudes and electoral issues, um, and I think you mentioned in the immediate, uh, the immediate post-war period, uh, that I'm, I'm going to sort of broaden the question a little bit, because in the immediate post-war period, when it comes to, to thinking about, uh, you know, a, a devastated Europe and um, uh, uh, a post-war United States that that, that dramatically that, that needed dramatic increases in uh, skill, skilled and unskilled labor that led to an opening of, for example, Germany to uh, uh, to labor migration from you know Turkey and elsewhere that of course has important knock-on effects today and the United States is. A Bracero program, whereby you know Mexicans were able to come to the United States and uh, uh, you know work and then go back and all of this stuff. And, and, and it's in the reason I like the question is because it it gets at um, the interdependent nature of this historical process. But I want to highlight um, uh, just the the intersection between uh, uh, attitudes, uh, 
public attitudes and these electoral issues because um, you know that that's why I think the story is a little bit dire because you have public attitudes, not just in the United States, but throughout the world that suggest that uh, uh, citizens in a variety of countries think that at best, if the level of immigration should stay the same, even though there are countries like Poland and Japan, whose demographic, uh, whose demographic uh, uh, context suggests that they're gonna have to uh, either, you know, triple their birth rate or, uh, have dramatically more immigration or else, you know, there's going to be sectors of their of their economy that just won't be able to survive or function like the healthcare sector, you know, that's what makes Poland's rejection of Syrian immigrants ridiculous because, you know, the Syrian immigrants, you know, were highly trained, educated in areas like healthcare and the Polish healthcare system had a dramatic um, understaffing problem that continues to this day. I think there's going to be like 2 million skilled vacancies in the, in the Polish labor market that could be easily filled. And, and I know that doesn't really answer your question, but it just presses harder against the fact that economic imperatives uh, are constantly in tension with um, the things that people think, which can be driven by, uh, call it nativism, old fashioned racism, symbolic racism, what, ha racism, what have you. And unless politicians um, uh, become insulated from this or unless uh, uh, some sort of exogenous shock, maybe a pandemic, uh, you know, hypothetically speaking, might change. I mean, like you, you have to think really big in my mind to envision a world in which all these things change because of this long durée historical process. Yeah, and uh, just a quick uh, reminder to our, uh, our listeners, uh, we, uh, the suggested readings uh, online, uh, some of which we will be referencing today, uh, uh, please check them out. Uh, all very interesting, including uh, work by our uh, speaker today, Andrew. Uh, uh, and and uh, if you could start uh, typing your questions in the Q&A, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start mentioning some of them as we go along. Uh, so. Uh, Andrew, to, to double down on this question of, of labor, right? Because you know it's 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 often what's at the forefront of people out out to restrict uh, immigration, uh, and you know the, the 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 other stuff on 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 culture, cultural purity, etc., mm -hmm. uh, tends to be viewed as uh, uh, you know off color, and only if a few politicians venture into that realm. But you know, mainstream politicians tend to talk about labor. Now, could you could you could you tell us sort of a global story about race and labor uh, that's that's global in its orientation, right? Uh, thinking about the mm. contingent effects of uh, brain drain versus brain gain debates in uh, low-income countries that send immigrants, uh, as well as you know questions about labor uh, and exploitation of labor in the developing world through the export of jobs, uh, but also, you know, the racialized hierarchical relationships that that creates, right? Uh, so that higher income, uh, citizens of high income countries can afford cheap stuff because citizens of low income countries are making them sweatshops. Uh, you know, how should we think about that, that bigger story, uh, which is uh, part of what, you know, the GPEP agenda is, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's, um, that's amazing. So wow, uh, that's, uh, that's a lot. Uh, let me try to, uh, to start uh, pecking away at it, because I think um, that sort of series of questions, I don't know, that sounds like a book series to me, quite frankly. Um, but let me start with trying to tell a global story about race and labor. Um, the reason the reason in my in, in, in my book project I focus on um, the sort of long durée effects of colonialism is because, you know, I I've read people like Emmanuel Wallerstein, Giovanni Arrighi, Beverly Silver, who 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 take a world systems uh, and historical approach to the global economy, and um, you know I'm not gonna you know drill too deep into that. But I think um, uh, the relationship between 
Anglo-European colonial exploitation and the division of the world into core periphery and semi-periphery peripheral areas in which um, certain countries play certain roles in global supply chains and um, our, our global perceptions of the type of work done in certain places and you know maybe the, uh, the moral and practical worth of certain people in certain places. I mean, I think this is just, I think this is just fundamental to the story because these perceptions carry through to the present day. And the reason I say that they carry through to the present day is because um, uh, these, these issues permeate modern economic thinking on the politics of immigration. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a Michael Clemens Lant Pritchett fanboy, um, if it didn't come out in the end of the, at the end of the talk. Um, but Clemens and Pritchett have these two incredible articles that I think one came out in the Review of Economics and Statistics and the other came out somewhere else, um, where they go through uh, the conventional wisdom and the conventional economic literature on the effects of immigration. It's called the New Economic Case for um, Immigration Restrictions, in which they unpack a, a very mainstream view that migrants from certain parts of the world we should be afraid of them because they're going to bring with them the stuff in inverted commas or in scare quotes that makes their states which are poor poor so that people somehow transmit the stuff that makes economies unproductive and the reason i love this article so much is because it really exposes this um this rational uh uh, this rational orthodox literature on why we should be afraid of immigration. And it says, okay, taking you at face value, sort of assuming the null hypothesis is true, assuming that we really live in a world in which this type of diffusion of total factor productivity exists. Um, by the way, the only reason we assume that that's the case is because of this historical uh, project that emerges out of colonialism and Western exploitation of places like Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and elsewhere. Assuming that's the case, they use um, um, both economic theory and statistics to show that we would have to have immigration from the quote-unquote developing to the developed world like orders of magnitude like beyond our wildest possibilities for that even to be the case. And the basic idea is even if you want to use this dubious argument, using this argument to warrant the idea that we need to restrict immigration because these people are going to bring poor stuff with them is crazy because if that, even if that's the case, societies are willing to, are, are able to absorb just a massive amount of immigration more than they already do. You know, maybe it's 20 times as much or something like that. I, I don't want to speak because the article has the stuff in it. Um, but that just really, um, uh, and, and look, I, there, somebody could make the argument that this type of scholarship grants too much to the people who rely on, you know, neocolonial, uh, arguments about the perceived productivity of certain parts of the world. You know, maybe uh, granting the premise is doing violence in some way. And, and I completely understand that because granting the premise can mask a, uh, this sort of long durée historical story, you know, that I briefly alluded to. But I think that's really, that's really the only way forward in conjunction with exposing this history. Because, I mean, I think as scholars and as, uh, uh, people who are maybe policymakers or who comment on policy, who are interested on policy, we need to wage a two front war that shows, look, these things, you know, this ideology that we take for granted that certain parts of the world are less productive. I mean, this is what it is. It's an ideology that's based on a long history of Western exploitation. There's nothing that, there's nothing fundamental about Southeast Asia that functionally means that there have to be sweatshops there or whatever. I mean, this is a historical story. On the other side of the coin, we also need to expose that even many of the most repugnant 
uh, pieces of conventional wisdom held by many people throughout you know, the academy and policymaking community can be refuted very, you know, not easily, it requires some math, but very definitively with a little bit of work. And, and, and I think we need to bridge these two things together um, to, you know, keep pushing the needle on warranted discernibility. Yeah. And, and you know, the, your last point kind of dovetails with my, my third question and, and something that uh, we already have in the comment section. Uh, by the way, uh, yeah, please uh, keep typing your questions. So over the next 15 minutes or so, uh, I'm accepting uh, questions from the Q&A section. Uh, and, 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 and Andrew, so one of um, uh, a question that I had was, you know, uh, our scholars, you know, what do we lose from uh, mainstreaming the research agenda uh, in this sphere, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because as Errol Henderson points out in, in, in the Q&A section, there's already lots of work out there uh, that, you know, may not be legible to uh, quant-oriented social scientists, uh, right? And so, you know, uh, uh, just from a, a scholarly or practitioner perspective, how do we bridge the two worlds that seems to be uh, speaking at cross purposes? And how do we make sure that even as we mainstream this research agenda, we don't forget on, or, or ignore previous works that may not be quant, uh, and especially that may be based in global South countries uh, mm -hmm. in order to have this discussion, right? Be uh, to totally globalize uh, this discussion. Yeah, oh, that's... Um... You know that, that that that's that's a really great question. And quite frankly, um, you know, it's it, it's it's one of the questions that 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 certainly keeps me up at night. Um, so I'll, I'll say first, I'll I'll say first, sort of from a from a disciplinary perspective. Um, I think it's very important for any scholar who purports to um, bring into the mainstream some aspect of the world or the academy that's been marginalized to pay respect to where that work came from and the scholarly tradition that it came in, the, the scholarly tradition that it's embedded in. And, 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 and that was the purpose of, and that was one of my purposes from, um, you know, going through that brief, you know, two slide uh, lit review at the very beginning. I mean, um, uh, I think credit needs to go where credit is due. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, the needle would not be pushed at all, unless um, the scholarship that came there first wouldn't have gotten there first. And, and, and that doesn't mean we, we always have to, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean going all the way back all the time to Du Bois and, you know, Alan Locke and others. I mean, this taught in, in, in practice, this means going back to them and paying respects to them, but also paying respects to the theoretical and critical work that came, that, that, that came before. And, um, uh, and look, I do appreciate the skeptics argument that we do lose something by mainstreaming, but I want to caution everybody by uh, when they say that um, uh, when they when they imagine that uh, uh, mainstreaming necessarily has something to do with the method that somebody uses to answer a research question. So um, I predominantly use quantitative research methods. But there's nothing about the act of using quantitative research methods that presupposes me from answering a question that somebody who is more steeped in a more critical IR IP research tradition um, uh, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't care about it. I mean, and I know um, uh, you mentioned uh, Errol Henderson, and if he's out there, hi Errol, good to good to good to hear from you. Um, he's he's the one who. Uh, 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 who directed me towards Du Bois's work in 1899 um, in Philadelphia, which I believe is one of the first quantitative studies uh, in sociology, and um, and and I and I want and I want to and I and I definitely want to uh, uh, to make that point. Um, but when it comes to bridging the two, you know, I guess if I had a really great answer for this beyond just. Uh, paying respects and not pretending like we reinvent the wheel. Um, I'll just say that 
I think, um, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to do my best to dance here. Um, I think, I think intellectual humility on the part of the mainstream is really important. You know, just because, um, just because for a variety of historical reasons that, you know, Bob Vitalis uncovers and, you know, Errol Henderson uncovers, you know, the, the mainstream of international relations sort of abandoned issues of race and racism after the Second World War uh, doesn't mean that if we start picking up now that we're completely reinventing the wheel. And um, this just gets back to my fuzzy point about, you know, mutual intellectual respect and humility, because I would never expect um, uh, I would never uh, expect somebody from a different research tradition to speak exactly with my same language, just, you know, in, in, in vice versa. And this is why I think, uh, 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 you know, dialogue like this is really important. And, you know, uh, uh, GPEP and co-authorships and research communities that are broad and Catholic in the best possible way um, are really the only way to go forward. So sorry for, uh, hedging and hemming and hawing, but, but that's a super important and difficult question that, um, that we should, that we should continue to unpack going forward. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, your, your last point kind of dovetails with, uh, uh Jessica Duhon's question, uh, about, you know, how to think about interdisciplinary research to dismantle, uh, scholarly, uh, uh, you know, previously racist works, uh, uh, and, and also, you know, to bring in uh, approaches from multiple directions. Oh, and yeah, and sort, of, right. sort of to build on this, you know, uh, in the spirit of praxis, right, because, uh, you know, most researchers in this field, right, are coming at it from a very normative perspective, mm -hmm. uh, right, so that, you know, in addition to all the uh, uh, amazing work that's driven uh, in part by the credibility revolution, there's also, you know, a normative desire to uh, do good, uh, right? And and given that you know not everyone listens to Michael Clemens, uh, right? Collier might have you know uh, a, a ready sort of uh, audience uh, more than uh, Michael. So you know, uh, just thinking, you know, how do we move from research to sort of a rhetoric that does the work of just empirically and objectively showing the objective truth about immigrants? And doing the heavy lifting of, you know, shifting attitudes through narratives and 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 sort of creation of a story of of of, of the world that we live in. Oh yeah, I mean that's I mean, two. I mean two fantastic questions. And um, so uh, the first thing I'll say after you know dub, sort of jumping off the very last point you talked about. So that's why we need critical perspectives on IR, IP, and, you know, the world at large, because um, uh, uh, the fact value distinction and all of these issues that people have been talking about in, in more critical circles for, uh, you know, generations um, have been slow on the uptake in, um, you know, I, I hate calling it mainstream, but it, but it is what it is, you know, more a mainstream almost always quantitatively approach, you know, quantitative circles um, and, 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 you know, reflecting on, uh, reflecting on the normative dimension of the things that we're actually trying to do is, 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 is super important. But I want to, but I want to go to the, the, the first part of the, the question now. Um, uh, how does this speak to, um, uh, sorry if I'm just paraphrasing, but how does this speak to, you know, breaking down uh, uh, disciplinary, subdisciplinary, uh, uh, boundaries to hopefully dismantle and destabilize a lot of this, um, uh, a lot of the structural issues that um, that have occurred that 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 are that are out there. Um, uh, you know, I guess I, I I wish I could put that on a bumper sticker and put it in my office or on my car because that's exactly um, that that's exactly what I'm trying to do here, and that's really. Um, and I'm going to be selfish for a second. I mean, that's the that's the spirit of the book to you know to to rely on. Uh, uh, philosophy, critical race theory, uh, history, historical sociology, and IR, IPE, and their associated, you know, methods, historical and quantitative. I mean, that's really um, what I'm trying to do. And uh, 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 the issue, though, that I think we need to confront um, is, I don't, I don't know if I call it a deeper issue, but it's certainly an issue. Um, I've, I can only talk from my personal experience. 
Um, I've had a very difficult time uh, in the early part of my career um, uh, dealing with some of the disciplinary politics that people don't talk about. So even though we like to say how important it is to take a cross-disciplinary approach in answering questions, both normative and positive, and, and come up with these synthetic stories warranted with evidence of various sorts, um, I think the scholars that actually do that tend to fall between stools. Um, it, it's very, um, you know, I guess, you know, Ken, if I asked you, I'm not, I'm not going to put you on the spot and actually ask you, but if, you know, if, if I asked you what type of scholar is, am I, what type of scholar is this Rosenberg guy, um, you know, I'm sure uh, you would have a very, you know, something awesome to say that would be really profound. But, but, but the issue is, is that in the, in the discipline that I find myself in, international relations and political science, you know, people have a really hard time putting their finger on what I am. And so for, you know, for uh, junior scholars out there, you know, maybe graduate students, if there are any in the audience, you know, this is something that is really difficult to deal with. And so as much as a lot of departments, colleges, universities, journals, associations love talking about um, crop breaking down borders and crossing boundaries and all of this stuff. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, brass tax time, um, people that actually try to do that type of work um, can be marginalized. And the people who tend to do that type of work, you know, tend to be people um, that uh, face other structural inequalities and um, disadvantages with this, you know, associated with getting their work out there and getting recognition. And so, you know, uh, this isn't a woe is me story. Like I'm incredibly lucky and privileged to be in the position that I am. I'm just thinking about going forward, trying to inspire the next generation of scholars, you know, which I'm probably a part to do this type of work. I think a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of this falls on the shoulders of the keepers of the discipline to actually put their money where their mouth is. And, and I know I didn't answer uh, exactly the question how I think it was phrased, but, but, but I think that it doesn't matter how much effort your know, junior scholars and graduate students put towards dismantling these disciplinary boundaries. Um, there's still a structure out there that makes it hard for this type of work to get recognition and get traction. And that speaks to why we need critical theory, right? And why we need critical approaches broadly defined, but also um, uh, uh, why we need, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna uh, um, uh, flatter the GPEP uh, program here. I mean, why we need, I mean, quite frankly, why we need programs like this, because the more programs there are like this, the more, um, uh, the more we can fight this. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about this question. And, um, you know, anybody yeah. who wants to talk more about this, please get in touch because, you know, I think um, uh, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, who are interested in similar areas. Yeah, so uh, Andrew, uh, in the next sort of three minutes, uh, and, and maybe you can give me a, a 60 second answer to this question. I'm gonna collapse uh, a few Great. questions uh, into one and, and you know, uh, and, and, and sort of it, it's under the general umbrella of, you know, what's the worth of an immigrant, all right? So, you know, in popular discourse, right, when we talk about immigrants, uh, even among, you know, mainstream progressive Americans or Europeans, right, there's often the idea that, you know, if someone says something about immigrants, the first thing people do is tell us that, well, you know, immigrants from Nigeria, the most educated immigrants in America, right? Immigrants from South Asia, uh, powering Silicon Valley, uh, right? Uh, basically defining the worth of immigrants based on their contribution to the economy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and so, you know, and, and, and going back to uh, where we started in your talk, right? This kind of also plays into the hands of the, the old stories about, you know, the places where these people come from and, and what they're like and what therefore these people are like. Uh, so how do we move from this world of, uh, you know, high skill, low skill uh, definitions and defining people uh, purely on the basis of their economic worth? Uh, sort of, is this the new sort of evolu, sort of the old French idea? Is this the new evolu, this notion of uh, what's what's your productivity as as a human being? 
wow, 60 seconds on that. Um, uh, so that really, oh, man. Um, let's, let's think here. Uh, the thing that I find funny about the issue that you just raised is that, you know, at least in the United States, um, many people who make claims about the worth of an immigrant on the basis of their potential to contribute economically to the productivity of society are people whose you know, ancestors were discriminated against on the basis of their putative unproductivity. And um, there's this sort of generational forgetting that takes place in the realm of uh, in the politics of immigration that I find both terrifying and uh, uh, interesting because uh, it, it, it's like a version of, you know, it's like a version of the, the fundamental attribution error where, you know, everybody assumes that the, the struggle, you know, I don't know, it, that this is me just, just, just riffing here. And um, the reason, and so I guess I don't have anything in my 25 seconds left to, to say anything profound about that, but I just will highlight, um, you know, one of my last slides where I talked about really trying to dig into the antecedents of what makes people think the way they do and whether we need to think about truth and reconciliation uh, or um, uh, a variety of, um, other creative institutions or public initiatives to uh, to destabilize this collective uh, amnesia that a lot of people have about you know um, their own ancestors' history and how that might impinge on their own views um, on immigrants in, in in the modern day and and I don't I don't really have a good answer for that but I do think. Um, further work in this area is warranted because, um, you know, we're not talking about radical cosmopolitanism here. We're just talking about helping everybody throughout the world understand that the moral worth of a human being has nothing to do with whether or not they can fix a car engine or whether they can program a computer. And, and um, uh, uh, I hope that, uh, you know, I hope people out there, you know, really take this mantle up. Well, uh, we are unfortunately out of time. This this has been a fascinating uh, discussion. Thank you, thank you, Andrew, for uh, creating the time and for sharing uh, your work with us. Uh, again, for the audience, we have suggested readings uh, on our GPEP website. Uh, we will have a recording of this session online uh, for uh, your future viewing, uh, and please share share it widely. Uh, and, and we thank uh, GPEB and the Motara Center uh, for making this possible. Now, we, the next uh, talk in this series will be on December 3rd, uh, and it will be on race and the international liberal, uh, the liberal international order. Uh, so please uh, uh, do sign up uh, for the talk on the, on the 3rd. Uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, and uh, we look forward to following your work and, and, and seeing you know, uh, more of your contribution in this field. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate the time, the opportunity, and Ken, um, you know, your questions were fantastic. I hope to cross paths soon. All right. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.